Thank you. I'm delighted to be here this morning. You know, as, as I was looking through the incredible list of speakers and some of the descriptions of the members of the audience today, I was stunned. Stunned by the incredible talent that we have in our Iranian alumni and our Iranian faculty. Something to be truly proud of. When I arrived here at Stanford in 1977, Iran was the second largest source of students in electrical engineering. Outside the US, it was Taiwan. Taiwan's dropped some. And there was Iran. And we had an incredible group of students. It was the second largest in electrical engineering. It was in the top five in engineering. It was the top 10 among the entire university for, grad, for a source of graduate students. Given the incredible talent we've seen, I hope a goal we can have as a university and a community is get back to those historic numbers because I think the talent base certainly exists and we should aim to do that. I think one of the most important things that's happened to Stanford in the last, in the most recent part of its history has been its evolution as a global university. That, of course, is a long history. And if you look at Stanford's history, it divides into, I think, what are three great eras. The first era was the era of beginning the university from 1891 to about 1950. In that period, the university was growing. It's hard to imagine that when Stanford was started, they had to go out and beat the bushes to find enough students to fill the hallways of the university because California was still a sparsely populated state. And they gave exams all over, from the Mississippi over. And that was how people like Herbert Hoover ended up coming from Iowa to Stanford, because he took the exam in Iowa and was accepted on the basis of that. Of course, in those days, we accepted a lot of students. <laughs> <laughs> As I'm fond of pointing out to Peter Bing and Senator Dianne Feinstein, who were in the same class, at that time, we were taking approximately 60% of the applicants. <laughs> But one of the key factors in those years are a couple of things that distinguished Stanford from the very beginning. Not only was its presence on the West Coast with the California view of the future and hopefulness, but two other things were very different. It had women from day one, unlike many of our East Coast peers. And it also had international students from almost the very beginning that came to the university. And I think that has shaped Stanford in a very different way than many other institutions in the United States. So that was a period of really growing the university. In the 1950s, there was actually one of the very first rankings done of American universities. And although some of our departments ranked quite well, overall, we were not ranked in the top 20 among American universities. But then the 1950s began. It was a transformative period with Sterling and Terman leading the university. And we began to emerge as one of the great American universities. Many things happened which built the future of the university. The Stanford Linear Accelerator got started. The medical school moved from San Francisco down to the main campus. And engineering under Fred Terman's leadership as provost grew by leaps and bounds, roughly doubling in size. Those were good bets because they all changed the nature of the university and its trajectory. So that by the end of, by that period, that next 50 years, oh, we also won our very first Nobel Prize around then. So it was the beginning of really building the quality of the university. From that period until 2000, we rose in stature. So that by 2000, Stanford was constantly ranked in the top five or so uh, American universities. The last 17 years since 2000 has been about turning Stanford into one of the great universities in the world. And that's focused on a number of things, the quality of the undergraduates, the quality of the graduate students, the quality of the faculty. When I arrived in 2000, we still st there were still a few schools in the United States that would regularly outcompete us for undergraduates or for faculty. There aren't any more. <laughs> That's been an amazing change. I never thought I'd see an article entitled Harvard, the Stanford of the East. 
<laughs> but it was really based on investing in the core things that a university does, in teaching, in getting the best, best undergraduates, in exposing them to small seminars and opportunities to really learn. And I think one of the most important things we did was to really make a big investment in financial aid so that we could attract the very best students irrespective of their family's ability to pay. And growing the international population, something that Gerhard Casper started. When Gerhard became president in 1992, only 5% of our students came from outside, undergrads came from outside the United States. That number he managed to grow to 7%. This class, 12% of our undergraduates come from outside the United States. So that's been largely what we've done in the last 17 years was the growth in the undergraduate class was used to get more international students. Because my belief is when I get a group of undergraduates sitting down for dinner around a table, I want one of those people to come from outside the United States to bring an international perspective, a different view on the world than our own students might have. Diversity is more than just about ethnic diversity. It's also about a difference in perspective from a global change. And that's absolutely crucial. But it's also, we've traditionally had lots of students. Our international cohort is obviously very well represented at the graduate level. About a third of our students, more than a third of our students right now uh, at the graduate level are international, and more than half in the engineering and science fields. But it's also important to take the U.S. students who are graduate students here and get them outside of the U.S., get them to parts of the world they haven't been to. They've all been to visit the great cities of Europe and they've all been to Hawaii. <laughs> we need to get them to go somewhere else. We need to get them to go to parts of the developing world, to see parts of the world they otherwise wouldn't get to. I think it's a key, a key to the success of the Valley and the university that you bring the very best talent. You know, when we look at universities, often we see the buildings that exist on our campus. We see the beautiful quad here. We see the new engineering quadrangle. You see all these incredible spaces. Universities are not about bricks and mortar. They're about people. They're about mixing of students and faculty, the intellectual vitality that exists, the spark that gets started when you put those together. And that's the thing that you have to remember is most important in the future of the university. Yes, you need the labs. You need the buildings to house the people. You need places to students to live. But it's about creating that intellectual excitement and exuberance that's really crucial. Of course, we also try to pursue this in our research mission. And I think for the last 16 or 17 years, that focus of that research mission has really been growing in two ways. One, with more focus on multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary work, really trying to think about the opportunities to contribute to the big problems we have around the world, not just in a narrow stovepipe fashion, but by bringing together groups of scholars in a collaborative fashion that can focus on a problem, can bring new ideas to the approach can put together, for example, a new energy technology with a new set of policies that will accelerate that technology and accelerate its adoption globally. If we have a technology and we don't get it out, broad use, if we don't solve not just the green energy problem in the United States, but the green energy problem in China, in India, and around the world, we will not prevent the effects of tragic climate change in our world. We've got to think differently about how we solve those problems. So we made deep investments in environmental sustainability, a problem that is going to be with us for the next 40 or 50 or 100 or 200 years as we grow on this planet. It's not going away. It's an important area to invest in. There'll be the problems we need to solve today, but there'll also be the problems to, that we need to solve in the future. If we ever can finally get peace in the Middle East, we're going to have a giant water shortage because there's not enough water to go around. How are we going to deal with that problem? Because that's going to create another sense of battle. There were lots of battles over oil. Future battles will be over water, particularly as climate change accelerates desertification in some parts of the world. 
What about the issues of peace, democracy, development? If we've learned anything from the Arab Spring, what we've learned is the path to democracy is not a yellow brick path. You just get on it and you follow it around and Dorothy shows you which way to go. It's a complicated process. It's hard to do. It's hard to change. And it's hard to take countries that have lived in one model of government and transform them into a, another model. It doesn't matter how much we think it's the right model or sometimes even how much the people want to embrace a different model. It's still not an easy path. It's a hard path. We need to understand how issues of democracy interlock with issues of a free press, interlock with issues of development and rule of law. In the end, we've got to bring better economic opportunities to people around the world. If we're going to have peace and security and the benefits of democracy, we also have to have economic development around the world. If we're going to have better health care and better education, you have to have economic development. You can't afford to have better health care and better education without better economic development. So these things are really interlinked. I think the other thing we've learned in the last 20 years is that the world is really a very small place. And the notion of isolating yourself from the rest of the world and cutting yourself off and creating a nirvana is just not realistic. You've got to deal with that, which means what happens around the world affects the stability of your part of the world. But it also means that we've got to deal with the issues around human health globally. What happens when you get an outbreak of Ebola in Africa affects not just Africa, but all of us. So we've got to think differently about how we approach problems in human health care as well. We've got to think about the genetic basis of health and how do we use the fact that we understand more about the human genome than we ever understood. How do we bring that benefit, that scientific advance, to change and improve the lives for everyone around the world? As I was getting ready to uh, step down as my, in, from my presidency, I started thinking about how much golf I could play and <laughs> how much time I could spend on the beach. And I decided that I didn't want to spend too much time playing golf or too much time on the beach because I, quite frankly, probably get bored. And I wasn't that good at golf anyway, so. <laughs> so I decided to try to think about what I'd, like to do, uh, what I'd like to do next. And at that time, I was struck by what I thought was a growing gap in the quality of leadership around the world. Since then, that was several years ago. That was probably three or four years ago. Since then, that was a bet I should have doubled up on from the beginning. <laughs> Look what's happening just in this country. Look what's happening around the world. And it's not just, the, it's not just government. Look at the NCAA basketball stand, uh, scandal. It's, it's universities who are complicit in this. Look at what happened at great companies like Wells Fargo and Volkswagen. These are horrendous failures of leadership, failures of leadership that did the, didn't do the right thing. So I began to think about what we, as a university, could do to address that leadership void. And I thought it was not just in the US, but it was globally. So we needed to do something that was international. We needed to do something that covered all ranges of disciplines, all kinds of careers, whether it was the academic, the nonprofit, the for-profit, and government. So I thought, what do universities do? Well, they take great talent and hopefully turn them into people who can go out and do great things in the world. That's what universities are fundamentally about, whether it's undergraduates or graduate students. So we decided to try to build a scholarship program that would, taking a page from other programs around the world, Rhodes and Schwartzman and Gates Cambridge, but doing something that was uniquely Stanford, that took advantage of the deep cultural history that Stanford has. Entrepreneurial, diverse, collaborative, innovative, and really try to build a program that would take 100 great students 
from around the world, give them a full scholarship in whatever discipline they want to study, but also give them the opportunity to build their own leadership skills, to learn how to get up and give a compelling talk, create a compelling vision for people, learn how to work with people who are in disciplines outside their own discipline, learn how to think about a life plan, learn how to think about difficult ethical issues. When you look at what goes wrong in many cases, they don't go wrong because all of a sudden somebody who was leading a company or leading an organization went from white to black overnight. They went wrong because they took one step down a slippery slope, then they took another step to cover that one, then they took another one, and then it was an avalanche, and it fell apart. How do you teach people about that? Well, you can. You can teach them about it. So we're looking for people who are intellectually terrific, highly capable, obviously. They have to succeed in whatever program they're in at Stanford, whether they're in a PhD or an MD or a JD or an MBA. But they're also, we're also looking for people who have integrity, humility, are empathetic, care about others, a desire to do well, not just for themselves, but a desire to do well for whatever organization they may be part of. You can help us. We've got to find 100 great students. And we've got to find students from, who come from around the world. So keep your eye out. If you see that incredible student, tell them to think about Knight Hennessy as part of their future. And together, I hope, my goal is simple. 20 or 30 years from now, I want to see a set of alumni coming out of our program that are helping change the world and make it a better place. And if we do that, it'll be a good investment for everybody. Thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions you might have.